London news agents. It's a good reminder to everyone, but particularly those in public life, to obviously be careful about unsolicited messages that they get, because there's lots of bad actors, as we're seeing around the world, uh, who are trying to cause damage to our democratic processes. As I said, there's a police investigation that's happening. It's important yes. that we work through these things in due time. So he's resigned from all his various positions, including from the, the Conservative Party whip. And the, the important thing here is we let the police... That was the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, on LBC this morning being asked about William Ragg, who until last night was a Conservative MP. He has now resigned the Conservative whip, having found himself at the centre of a scandal which involved his sending not only sexually explicit material of himself to an unknown person, but also, as part of that, the numbers of his fellow Conservative MPs to a person who he says was essentially blackmailing him. Yeah, and when this story broke about William Bragg on Thursday night, there was a mixture of, I guess, sympathy, empathy for what Mr Ragg had been through and anger that he had released his colleagues' details, contact details, to the person who had solicited them. And today we're going to go a little bit further and try to find out where this story originated from, with the journalist who first broke it a week ago, Aggie Chambray, who's at Politico, and try and understand what the Westminster honey trap was all about and how she realised it was going on. Welcome to the News Agents. It's Lewis. It's Emily. And just to start then with what we know today about William Ragg, he has resigned the whip, which means that he stays as an MP until the next election, but he's no longer a Conservative MP. He is not somebody that Rishi Sunak can count as one of his parliamentary party. This follows his resignation from that famous backbenchers committee, the 1922, where he also had a key role. And I guess it follows a certain amount of anger or frustration with the way Rishi Sunak originally dealt with this case of William Ragg, who I think was greeted with an overriding sense of empathy as if he had been a victim. He had, and not as if he had been the person who had, you know, shared these confidential numbers that belonged to his colleagues. And so this is Will Ragg probably taking the upper hand now on a situation that he felt he had to control before it became sort of too difficult to sort of push on with the current position. But of course, although Will Ragg is at the centre of it, this is a much wider story. We know that lots of people apparently have been contacted by this same person. To what end, we don't know. He he clearly went further than others have done. Many have talked about how they just ignored it. They realised that this person was someone they didn't know. But it has raised lots and lots of questions about how wise our MPs and people who work at the centre of politics might be, how vulnerable our system might be, potentially to bad actors who might try to use blackmail, who might try and use technology, WhatsApp, dating sites, whatever it might be, to solicit information from MPs, not just about themselves, but about their colleagues as well. Well, we're joined now by the woman who broke the story, Aggie Chambre the Westminster Insider host for Politico. Hello. Aggie, congratulations on the story. It's been a real sort of slow burn, actually, hasn't it, over the course of the week? It's built up. It really has, and even going back further than that, I mean, we have been looking into this, my colleague Dan Bloom and I, for two months. So kind of mid-February was when we first became aware of these very similar messages. So he became aware of a message first and said to me, and I was honestly, you know when you're sort of half listening to someone, he was like, oh, there's this weird message that I've seen, and it says that this person had met met someone before in Parliament and they had a little flirt. And it sort of did something in the back of my brain. I didn't listen to it. And a few days later, I was talking to a Labour staffer and they were like, oh, I've got this weird message and showed me their phone. And on the message, it said, it's from a different number. It had a different profile picture, but it said, hey, we met in Parliament and we had a little flirt. And I was like, hang on, that's really weird. Mm. Two different numbers. We had a little flirt. What's going on here? And so I messaged Dan and was like, hang on, I think there's something weird going on here. And obviously your mind, my mind, immediately went to spies, which we can get onto. I'm not sure that was quite right. But we basically started and I 
went around and asked everyone I've literally ever met in Westminster, have you got a weird message from either of these two numbers? Uh, Has anyone asked you if you've had a little flirt recently? <laughs> yeah. Slightly well, exa Exactly. Yeah. And it's quite awkward saying to kind of contacts like, hey, have you got a weird sort of flirty message? But anyway, that's what I did. And last Wednesday, we finally got to the point where we'd found six people who'd had these messages. We spoke to four experts, produced this dossier, and the experts said, no, no, this, this is dodgy. At that point, we published. Uh, and that's how we got the story out initially. How similar were the messages that these six people shared with you? The original six? Because the original six didn't include William Ragg. Did not include William Ragg. That's right. So... The thing was, if you looked at all of these screenshots next to each other, there was it, the, the sort of way they spoke was very similar. And in a way, it sort of almost seemed like AI. You know, I would never say we had a little flirt. And that was in three of the messages, I think. But the other thing that was really striking about these messages, apart from the fact that they were going to politicians, journalists, staffers, was that they knew little bits of information about them. So they knew people's names. They knew who people worked for. They said, oh, I saw we met on the Midbeds campaign trail, which was an actual by-election. <laughs> exactly. That this person was actually at, or we met uh, when we were doing Lisa Nandy's leadership campaign together. And do you think they got that information just from photos at the time, or do you think they were on those campaigns? They were in those rooms? So I am almost... 100% sure they were not in those rooms, partly because even before we published that first story, one of the people that we spoke to checked with everyone that had been a volunteer on the Midbeds campaign trail and there was no one of this name. They were going by names of Charlie or Abby. Since then, we've heard about them calling themselves Abby Miller, who worked for Policy Exchange. That person does not exist. Yeah. There was another one of some, they said, oh, I work for William Ragg. That person does not exist, although that was a bit more of a complicated story because William Ragg at one point said they did exist. The weird thing about these messages as well was that they became sexual very quickly in some cases. So they'd sort of say, hello, we met in this place. I know about your relationship breakdown. We talked about X. Anyway, here's a picture. And the pictures were often explicit. And in one of these cases, in the first six, someone did respond uh, because they believed that this was someone they had actually met. So they got into a sort of explicit conversation with this person. They were sexting back and forth. They actually arranged a meet up and the person who was Charlotte in that instance never showed. But this person was genuinely expecting to meet someone in the pub. Just talk us through sexting, right? Yes. Because, and I, you know, I probably come from a generation where madly, we've never sent pictures of our genitalia to people, right? And I don't know how common that is now. This is more than you bargained for, wasn't it, Aggie? <laughs> I mean, uh, I just... I No, but I'm just trying to get my head yeah, around is, yeah. whether sexting means, you know, as you would say, the, sort of the more, more flirtatious talk, or whether you're literally talking about dick pics on your phone. So, I mean, in this instance, and in a lot of the instances, I am literally talking about them sending dick pics. I mean, sometimes they were women, so uh, female genitalia as well. Uh, I don't, I mean, absolutely no judgment to any of these people. And I very much feel strongly that a lot of them are victims and were really brutally tricked. Uh, I don't think I would ever send, uh, make a picture of myself to someone that I wasn't sure that I'd ever met before. Uh, that is not something I would ever do. And I am in my mid thirties, maybe I'm a bit too old, but especially in the instance with the first person, you know, they believed this person was real. They believed they had met them and they believed this person fancied them and wanted to keep talking to them about uh, themselves. Aggie, do we have a sense of what ultimately these, whoever was responsible, obviously we don't, we don't know, what they wanted? I mean, we know none of these people you're talking about, the six that you initially identified mm. are MPs. One of them was an MP. One of them was an MP, okay. No, MP. I mean, do we have a sense of ultimately where they wanted this to go? I mean, they were sending sexually explicit material. Was it just about blackmail? Really good question. So I've talked a lot about the initial six. We are now on 22, I think, of people that we have explicitly spoken to and verified that the, the numbers were the same people. And that's on Grindr and on WhatsApp as well. In none of the first six instances, they asked for any kind of work information. And in fact, they haven't since either uh there was a bit of there was a, a sort of spurt of these messages going around lib dem and labor conference and in that instance they were sort of asking for gossip to substantiate gossip who was sleeping with who who might be interested in sleeping with them but no at no stage have they really asked for like work details so the motive is still kind of unclear i mean i think experts are beginning to think it might be 
one rogue person who's sort of interested in the sexual aspects of it but but as you say they don't know who's behind it yet and there isn't a clear motive but i think the other thing that has come out as we've gone on is we are aware of 22 people and i am not including andrea jenkins from that because i have not spoken to her directly and i Mm. haven't verified the number neither has my colleague dan every single other person is a man they are between about 20 and their early 40s and they are all and this is a deeply deeply subjective thing to say but they are all kind of good looking from westminster standards Mm. i mean all the kind of people that have been contacted there is really 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 a profile of them and they are all sort of the same makeup i mean they are you know as you say journalists politicians there's even a minister a serving government minister in there but but that's the thing that ties them all together their age their gender and also the fact that they're all sort of good looking and just to go back to the abby charlie thing Mm. i mean you talk about two numbers two profile pictures you think it's probably one person right or yeah, exactly. And and that was something that we suspected strongly um, from the beginning. But actually now we have seen a set of messages uh, where that's essentially confirmed because they messaged first as Charlie uh, and the person blocked them very quickly. And then they messaged as Abby 24 hours later. And the person said, hang on, you're, you're, you're just the person that I blocked yesterday. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, well, I, I was sad you blocked me. So, so that is the clearest idea that we have. That and they you are think it's person. sexual? You don't think, I mean, to go back to your initial flicker, espionage i mean do you think it's anything properly kind of malicious about this in terms of somebody acting against the state no no but there are obviously i mean there are police investigations open now there are lots of people much cleverer than me working on it my instinct at the moment and i believe the instinct of experts is it's probably not a hostile but it could state. have been and the fact that if it's not a hostile state and the fact that whoever this is and you've already alluded to it, Aggie, had obviously, I mean, there's at least 22, there must be more. Well, exactly. Must yeah. be more. Managed to get all of these numbers one way or the other. Mm. And at least with one MP, who we know, William Ragg, managed to go quite far down the chain in terms of how this was playing out to the point that he was giving them other MPs numbers. Well, exactly. In a way, the motive is sort of, if we, if we look away from the story for a second, People did engage, numerous people engaged. One MP was effectively blackmailed into giving out information in, in the terms of William Ragg. That is sort of terrifying. And they did; they were able to contact these MPs. And as you say, it could have been a hostile state. They could have got a lot more from William Ragg than just phone numbers. So Not in tech. any way. What, I mean, just WhatsApp, right? Or, or it's just, Grindr it's just, or it's just it, WhatsApp. Is it a criminal offence? Well, the police are looking into it, so I don't, I don't know where that will go, but there are at least uh, Leicestershire Police and Met Police are looking into it. What, what would it be? I mean, I'm trying to think what the... Is it enticement? Is it? Is there an offence of, of a honey trap? Is there a... Well, I think part of it is sending um, explicit images unsolicited. Right. That's, uh, that's definitely something that they're looking into. And, and obviously, RAG has, has ended up at the centre of it, particularly in terms of the Conservative Party's reaction, because there are lots and lots of MPs, Conservative MPs, who are deeply, deeply unhappy, aren't they, about, well, obviously, for what RAG has done, but also with the Prime Minister's reaction, the Chancellor's reaction to it, the fact that he's now resigned the Conservative whip, but he's done so voluntarily, it wasn't taken from him. So it's becoming, it's an internal Conservative political issue as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, obviously when Rag came out on Thursday night, I think there was initially a lot of sympathy for him and people Mm. do feel like he was a victim in all this. Um, But obviously things have moved on since then and yesterday he resigned from 1922 and then from PACAC and now obviously he's voluntarily resigned the whip. But I think some people are saying... We should say he's leaving Parliament anyway, so it's not like it's ended his career ahead of time. Exactly, but, you know, he is leaving under a cloud uh, and I think a few people are kind of questioning Tory MPs as you say are kind of questioning why he did it voluntarily do you think he's a victim yeah do you not yeah I think he, yeah I do I think I think so yeah but I think it's possible to be we talked about this with West Streeting yesterday it's possible mm. to be both things right both a victim but also he has in handing over those numbers he obviously did a bad thing in terms of the security of other people, which is yeah. clearly problematic. You're not naming the Labour MP, but what was their response in all this? I mean, when you broke the news to them that they'd probably been a, a victim of this sting. So this is actually something really, really interesting. A lot of the Labour staffers, uh, not including the Labour MP in this, but a lot of the Labour staffers basically say they have never been in the same room as William Rag. They have never met William Rag. They don't know William Rag. They are very, very, very unsure how William Rag would ever have got their numbers. And obviously, you know how it works in Westminster. It's very easy to get 
people's numbers in Westminster, everyone's in WhatsApp group chats. But these Le- Labour staffers are confused as to how William Rag could have got their number. So it doesn't seem like, and as you say, William Rag is has been put at the centre of the story, but he's responsible for giving out all of those numbers. Mm. And I think that's something my colleague Dan Bloom picked up as well, that this doesn't quite add up. And obviously there's the, not obviously, but there is a grinder element, element of it as well, because at Lib Dem conference, this person who was Charlie at the time rather than Abby, was messaging people on Grinder and the gay Tinder, yeah, th- exactly, uh, and contacting people through that medium as well. So I think William Rag obviously has admitted to giving out some numbers, and the Tory MP whose numbers he gave out uh, obviously annoyed about that. But I don't think it makes sense that he gave out all the numbers. Mm. Mm. How much further do you think this story could yet run? Again, how how much do you think there's more to it? I mean, you've just alluded to it there in a way that it doesn't make sense. Rag's at the centre of it for now. But it doesn't make sense in the sense that he is at the centre of it. He was just one person who was contacted. Do you think there are other layers to it that may yet emerge? Honestly, we've been working on this story well for two months, but it's been published for seven days. And every time you think you're really close to getting an answer to exactly what's going on, three more lines of inquiry spring up. Mm. So, I mean, even yesterday we published this story, we tracked down the person whose photos were being used on WhatsApp. So the profile picture on right. WhatsApp was this guy. And then on Grindr, it's a picture of the same guy in three different photos. And we found the Facebook account, my colleague Dan found the Facebook account of the guy who it was. And we are like, oh my God, we found him. I suppose the guy, this guy had nothing to do with it. He said he'd reported the stolen pictures to the police after we contacted him. Yeah. But that just... It's just an example of how these things keep happening. You think you've, you're about to solve the entire mystery and then more more questions arise. So I, I think there's much more to come. I think we still don't know who's behind it. We still don't even know who the, what the motive is. And I think, yeah, this story could still run and run. Thank you, Chambry. Brilliant to have you in. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much for having Thanks, me. Well, Louise is in the Rhonda Valley and you're through to the Prime Minister. Go ahead, Louise. Morning to you. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Prime Minister. Hi, Rhonda. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Louise, Louise in the Rhonda oh, Valley. Louise, hi, sorry, Louise, Louise I missed in the that. Rhonda Valley. No, Louise, Louise, hi. <laughs> well, I'm back with Kensington. Uh... <laughs> that, that is the clip that's gone viral today from Rishi Sunak's interview with Nick Ferrari on LBC. And you can see how kind of horribly awkward that is. And to be frank, how easily that could happen. You just hear the wrong bit and you, and you sort of, you know, give the caller the wrong name. You call me Streatham all the time. All the time. All the right? time. Yeah. yeah, and when he moved house, it got so confusing. I know. No identity I know, for I months. Know, it's awful. But I guess the point is, in that interview, particularly the call with Louise, we understand more about the Prime Minister than you get at first from that slip of the tongue. He reveals more about himself. And frankly, the way he thinks of or talks to the voter, wherever that voter is, which is really, really eye-opening in terms of understanding that relationship that Rishi Sunak will have on the campaign trail whenever that actually starts in earnest. Yeah, I think um, this phone-in uh, with Sunak and Nick Ferrari on LBC, he's, he's done it a few times before, he does it with Stam uh, as well, and um, you know, there were no kind of like big landmines, the political landmines that, that went off, he didn't make any massive, huge mistake or anything like that, but as you say, Emily, I do think it was quite revealing of him and the way he, in small ways, and the way that he interacts with people and the way that he deals with political problems, which, as you say, could become a problem on the campaign trail. So that same caller later on, basically her story, Louise's story, was that she has been unwell, she's out of work and on benefits, she's waiting for a psychotherapist, and she can't get one. Um, That will be a story that resonates with many people, I'm sure. And you can imagine how a politician might react to that often with empathy with solidarity trying to ask more about her circumstances this is how as part of that conversation the prime minister reacted to it which Louise, NHS Louise? trust is this uh, louise it's, i can't say it in welsh but it's uh, right <laughs> well actually you can't say it in, I, ah, it's well, welsh. I think that well that's i think that's that's an interesting point actually louise because you it's the labor party who run the nhs in wales as you know because devolved government in wales and i think you know actually there's a very clear contrast to what's happening between england and wales like across the uk all NHSs have experienced uh, backlogs from COVID. It's the aha, isn't it, that, that kind of gives it away, where he says the quiet part out loud, which is to ignore what Louise is clearly going through. Her voice tells us that she's finding this quite difficult and quite hard to talk about and presumably has suffered um, quite a lot of, of trauma in, in sort of trying to explain 
what her circumstances are. And presumably and, has rung up out of some desperation. Well, because she doesn't she doesn't think which which authority I'm talking to. She thinks she's talking to the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, which she is. Mm. And that moment that you can hear Rishi Sunak almost find the arm's length distance between her problem and his problem, which is that the Rhonda Rhonda Valley is Labour run because Labour's, you know, in government in Wales. And you can hear Rishi almost kind of go, <laughs> it's a gotcha, right? Mm. Oh, don't worry. I'm, we're going to, we're going to be okay. This proves my point. This proves my point, which is not really why she's calling. No. And you can imagine a more skillful politician. In fact, a lot of politicians, maybe not even that skillful, essentially saying, wanting to find out, look, uh, Louise, tell me about your circumstances. Ex- exactly where are you? What's your history been with this? I'll talk to my team. You know, we'll do what we can. Or and then maybe, I mean, you advice. still could, could advise Louise who to go to, uh, even if it's something that you do not govern yourself. Well, and right? then maybe in parenthesis, and this is where the politics come in, you just sort of happen to mention, almost in passing, that Labour run Wales has worse outcomes and all of these things, and we're concerned about it, and we're pressuring them to do something about it. But of course, that's no concern to you. Yeah. You're just your worried. Problem, your yeah. problem is about getting this help, for, uh, you, this help yeah. for you, which is what my which is my concern as well. And we're doing everything we can to ensure that happens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next caller. And I think you're, you're completely right, Emily. There was there is this sense sometimes with Sunak. This has happened with these other phone ins as well, where he has his his tone, his register is pretty defensive. And this was shown again in a second call. And I thought this was in some ways even more revealing. And this is a call which actually I think was potentially a tremendous opportunity for Sunak. Mm. This is a call from a man, Jerry, who said he had voted Conservative in every election since Margaret Thatcher's first election in 1979. So this is an absolute stalwart Tory voter. And he said for the first time his current intention was to vote for reform instead. And we know that this is a significant political problem for Sunak. Jerry is like many, many Conservative voters. And so here's what he was asking Sunak, why shouldn't I? So here was an opportunity being presented to him on a platter to provide a fluent, passionate answer as to why Jerry and potentially millions of others like him shouldn't do so. Instead, this is what Sunak said. First of all, thanks for your support for the party over so many years. That's fantastic. And I'm sorry to hear about it. But all I'd say is next election, there's going to be one of two people prime minister at the end of it, me or Keir Starmer, on the two issues that you mentioned, you should just come to a view on who you think is more likely to deliver for you. And on the issue of net zero, I don't know if you remember, last year I stood up and made a very significant speech, changed our approach to net zero, was very clear that we can't rush to it in an ideological way that saddles costs of 5, 10, 15 grand on ordinary families like yours. Didn't think that was right. Change the policy on it. Of course, we're going to get there. I've got young kids. I care about the environment. But we should do that in a sensible way, especially when we're doing a better job on it than pretty much anyone else. And when it comes to tackling illegal migration, you know, I'm battling the Labour Party and everyone else to get our Rwanda bill through Parliament. So look, I'm, look those are the issues that you care about. I care about them too. I've already showed that I'm delivering on them. And as I said, if you vote for reform, all you're going to do is put Keir Starmer in power and then we're going to get no action. Is that brittleness that we've talked about before and the defensiveness of... Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, here was an opportunity to say, right, Jerry, how do we get you back? Yeah. Jerry has gone to the trouble of picking up the phone. He wants right? to be told. He wants somebody to woo him, yeah. to embrace him, to he bring him back into the... He obviously feels uncomfortable about it. Of course. He's a you know, Tory. He's not just going off and doing it. He's saying, Rishi, this is where I am. Tell me I'm, tell me I'm wrong. But Rishi actually does tell him he's wrong. Yeah. I mean, in not very subtle ways. And I think that is your opening. That is your opening to say, <laughs> well... Yeah, that's not going to work, is it? I think and I'm doing this. And also, I think Jerry's whole argument in the longer version of the question is that he's talking about legal migration. And I think that also gives you a window into Sunak's priorities because, yes, the small boats thing has been the thing that he has consistently put on, you know, every podium, every leaflet, every speech, every campaign. And yet Jerry there is talking about why the numbers have actually gone up in terms of legal migration from, you know, his pledge of 300,000 to closer to 800,000. I mean, I think this all comes down to one thing, right, which is that politics fundamentally, elective politics is the art of persuasion, right? And Sunak seems to believe that it is self-evident that voters and conservative voters ought to vote for him. He basically tells Jerry that he's stupid. 
he basically says that if you do what you're doing, you're stupid because all you're going to do is get the real opposite of what you want. Instead of saying, levelling with him and saying, look, what can I do? You tell me, you know, I'm, I'm humbly ask, asking you, tell me what I need to do to win you back. Here's a few things that I think that we're doing that I don't think maybe I'm not getting this across enough to try and allay your concerns on these matters. And I by don't... the way, and by the way, he could say, and the thing is about reform, Jerry, is that ultimately they are not a proper governing party. They are not going to deliver. They're, they're telling you a load of things I mean, that they want you that. to hear. Well, he, he sort of does, but he doesn't. I think he, he treats doesn't. him like he's stupid. I think the... Well... I, I mean, I think the argument he's making is the one that he would make to us, to journalists, to anyone. He'd say, you know, reform aren't going to get into power, so basically you're helping Keir Starmer into power, which is what people but say. he sounds Richard peeved about it. He sounds peeved that the guy might have come he to this conclusion. He just doesn't sound generous, does he? I mean, there is... Uh, you use the word humble, I think. You know, yeah. there is very little humility. Completely. And I think the thing that you forget, and it must be really hard being a politician, actually. Of course. Is just how how humble you have to be to the voter the whole time for every single vote, right? Yep. Because that decision lies with, as you said, making people want you. Yep. And if they decide that they don't want you, then it's it must really hurt, and right? Absolutely. And I can, of course. And he's under tremendous pressure and he's working, you know, probably 18 hours a day and not getting the results he wants. And so, of course, it's easy for us to sit here and carp. Of course it is. But at the same time, he is in the business of elected politics and in six to eight months' time, he's going to have to put himself between, before millions of voters. Yeah. And his party right now, right now, are considering whether this guy is the guy to lead us into that election of a catastrophe. And yet, this is the attitude that he's presenting to voters. And it re what it really made me think of is the Tim Shipman piece at the weekend in the Sunday Times, where the key line from that was his saying, apparently to his aides, that he does not understand why people can't see that he's right. And that was precisely the vibe and precisely the sense that he was conveying to every single one of those voters, yeah. particularly Jerry. Why can't you see that yeah. my argument is correct? The point of elective politics is not that it's self-evident. The point is you have to persuade them. I that. totally agree. And I think, you know, if you go back through um, sort of previous campaigning PMs, right? So I'm going to put Boris Johnson into that category and um, David Cameron... And, I, and obviously Theresa May, not Liz Truss, what they have all believed fundamentally is that they are right. I mean, I think you cannot go to the country and sell a policy. You shouldn't be in politics you if you should, don't think you're right. Unless you think you're right. But it's about that tone of empathy. It's about the pause that lets somebody explain their problem to you fully before you just sort of stamp on it and go, oh, oh, you're wrong. And there is, there is another factor at work with with this recently as well which is we talked about Cameron yesterday and how he's filling the void on foreign policy there is this narrative that is also starting to build up that is that Cameron people may have seen this if they're on Twitter is keeps doing these kind of foreign office uh, peace to camera videos where he's explaining what he's doing or he's doing these pool clips and it is a reminder that for all of his political deficiencies which there were and his mistakes and so on and his legacy which is checking in lots of ways there is no two ways about it the guy is a gifted communicator yeah, and he's, he's got better polished. at it he's very very polished and of course he's been in politics for way longer yeah. it's a reminder that Sunak only an MP since 2015 Cameron was an MP from 2001 he's been at the game way longer I think we but said it sort this. of reminds us you know us right of at the very beginning on that fateful Monday when David Cameron and um, walked into Downing Street and we suddenly, you know, sharp intake of breath and we realised what was coming next, is that Sunak has basically placed another Prime Minister in the public's eye yes. simultaneously to yes. his own role. Yes. And so you are constantly judging him, not just by sort of predecessors, which is kind of, let's be honest, easy for him, like Liz Truss, but by the man who is literally sitting around the cabinet table, who's literally on the global stage, who's literally meeting the world leaders, who's literally shaking the hands, who's probably getting more policy done and changed, as we were saying on yesterday's podcast, than the Prime Minister himself is now. And so you have this, it's like watching a sort of, a, you know, those photosynthesis experiments you used to do as kids, where you have the control and then you have the take away the sunlight one. You know, you see what the person who knows how to be Prime Minister yeah. is acting. And I think that sort of stares you in the face. Before we go, we should just tell you what we're talking about on the News Agents USA episode tonight, which is this extraordinary move by the state of Arizona, where they have essentially brought in an abortion ban 
that comes from a law passed in 1864. Just to put that in context, this is a law passed before Arizona was a state, before women had the vote, and before slavery had ended. This is a near total ban on abortion for women in the state of Arizona. Lincoln just gearing up for his re-elect then. I mean, it is astonishing. It's, it was, what, 50 years before universal suffrage came in, and yet... America wasn't 100 years old. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and here we are. Here Arizona is about to implement a law, along with many other states, and we've looked a little bit already at what's happening in Florida, which could see abortion banned, women whose health is in danger not helped, and people, doctors, medical professionals convicted, sent to jail. That is the America that we are on the cusp of seeing now. We're going to talk about that in a bit more detail on News Agency USA. I look forward to it. Uh, we should go for our daily kebab, shouldn't we? We should be off for the kebab. Where's All right. Moody? Come on, Moody. Walkies. Bye-bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 